Hello everyone, my name is Blake Jackson and I'm a senior studying agricultural economics at Colorado State University. Um, I'm currently in the process of applying uh, to law school to hopefully study water law and I hope I have the opportunity to um, study law after I graduate. Um, and just a quick reminder as we go into our next speaker, um, as our speaker is giving their talk, go ahead and jot down any um, questions or thoughts that you have um, that you might um, want the speaker to respond to in the Q&A session and we'll go ahead and um, process those later. So it's my, pl my pleasure and privilege today to introduce Ms. Saswati Bora, Head of food, Inno food Systems Innovation at the World Economic Forum. Ms. Bora heads the World Economic Forum's global initiative on leveraging technology and innovations to address food systems challenges as well as their agriculture work in India. As part of this work, she is responsible for content development, partnership facilitation, and program development on food systems transformation. Before World Economic Forum, Saswati worked in the Agriculture and Rural Development Department of the World Bank, where she helped establish the Global Agriculture and Food Security Program and the Global Food Crisis Program. Saswati has almost two decades of experience in agriculture, food systems, and rural development, including three years working as a journalist in India. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Saswati Bora. Thank you, Blake, for this lovely introduction. Um, um, and thank you for welcoming me to the Ag Innovation Summit of uh, CSU. Um, um, as uh, Blake mentioned, uh, my name is Sashwati Bora, and I lead uh, the food systems innovation work at the World Economic Forum. Um, uh, just before uh, we, um, we start, I thought maybe perhaps I'll give you a little bit of an introduction about the World Economic Forum. Most of us know us because we organized this um, strange conference in a, in a, in a mountain top in Switzerland in ja January called Davos. But actually, we do actually much more uh, work than just that conference. So we are actually an international organization for uh, public-private cooperation. So our mandate is to find innovative ways for the public and private sector to work together uh, to address global challenges. Um, food and agriculture is, of course, one of our really one of our um, most established programs at, at the World Economic Forum. We have been working on this for several years now. And one of the big flagships that we did was after the food crisis, we set up uh, the New Vision for Agriculture Initiative, which was really trying to, uh, you know, promote. Um, three goals, which is food security, environment and sustainability, and economic opportunity. And uh, through this initiative, we have been working with almost 700 organizations all across the world uh, to set up partnership platforms. And what these partnership platforms have been doing is to really bring together private sector uh, sort of uh, from across the value chain to work on a sort of a pre-competitive collaboration space with governments and civil society and farmer leaders to develop integrated value chains. Um, so these partnership platforms are now in 25 countries. Um, over the last few years, we have sort of taken a step back to really look at sort of a broader approach towards agriculture and food and really to really see what, where could we sort of leverage our our, um, you know, our convening, our network, our multi-stakeholder platforms to, you know, to address sort of future challenges in food and agriculture. So today's discussion, today I will sort of focus a little bit of my remarks on sort of the, um, uh, what we are seeing in terms of like the global trends on uh, food uh, and agriculture um, and uh, what are the innovations that we are also seeing and really looking, making a, what we call the call for innovation. So let's just hope that I can figure out how to use the clicker. Uh, nope. That always happens to me, and I work on innovation. But yeah, yeah. So, um, so, uh, so a few years back, as I mentioned, we really took a step back to look at like what do we really want. Uh, what is the aspirational goal we want uh, for food systems, especially if you are to meet the uh, sustainable development impact goals? And um, we basically came up with, with a lot of discussions. We thought that we actually the food systems had to meet around uh, four key aspirations. First, it has to be inclusive. Uh, so it has to ensure economic and, um, um, and social inclusion for all actors that are involved in the food systems, whether it's um, um, farmers, consumers, um, women, and youth. It has to provide jobs and other opportunities. It has to be also, the second pillar is sustainability. It has to you know, um, minimize the negative impact it has on the environment and um, conserve scarce resources. 
Third, it has to be efficient. It really needs to provide adequate amounts of healthy and nutritious food. It has to do so by reducing food loss and waste. And lastly, it has to meet health and nutrition outcomes. We need to provide healthy food, healthy diets, for and healthy life for a growing uh, population. So, uh, but what we are seeing is that we are far from achieving those. And uh, there's a lot of um, key trends or demographic challenges or shifts that are happening that is, that is going to put increasing pressure on food systems. First of all, we know that the global population is now going to increase to uh, 9.7 billion people by 2050. That's like around 40% increase since 2010. And um, we'll see also a really rising middle class and in developing countries, rising in um, um, urbanization. So this will not only increase the demand for food by around 50% by 2050, but it will also put change the shape of the demand. We will see a much more, much more rise in, um, a rise in like demand for um, sort of um, more processed food, more meat, more dairy, which will provide, which will really create a lot of uh, pressure on um, some of um, uh, and um, on our environment, nutrition, and health. Um, we are also seeing quite a these shifts are driving new challenges on environment, health, and nutrition. Um, you know, our current diet patterns is really putting pressure on our natural resources. We know. Um, the latest IPCC report came out and it said that agri-food sector is responsible for what, around 20 f 21 to 37 percent of the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which is quite substantial. And we already know that um, the sector is also responsible for 70 percent of deforestation. And what's really s scary is that if we, if we continue our current rate of unsustainable agriculture practices, it's been um, the, uh, it, it is projected it will that 95% of the world's land will be degraded by 2050, which is quite a shocking number. And we also see that this this is also um, we are also seeing this huge trend on health, nutrition, and 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 um, 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 and um, obesity. Um, in spite of a lot of progress in the last three decades, we are seeing that in the last three years, the number of uh, people who go hungry at night has increased. We have around 820 million people who are hungry. Um, there's around 2 billion people who don't have access to safe, sufficient, and nutritious food. And the economic cost of this is really staggering. I mean, we are already seeing that um, obesity itself annually will cost around $2 trillion US dollars. Um, and and that's because of the healthcare costs and the cost to sort of an, uh, economic productivity. Um, we are also seeing like um, it is kind of tragic that all of uh, we all the food that is produced is like one third of it annually is lost uh, or wasted. Um, it's it's putting a huge. If you put a number to it, they are saying around uh, more than 900 billion food is uh, is um, lost annually, and it's emit around eight eight percent of greenhouse gas em 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 emissions. But again, and as the panelists were mentioning earlier today, we are also confronted by this, um, by the issue that we, the, the world's farmers are aging. I mean, young people don't want to go into uh, um, agriculture now. And the average US farmer, uh, they say, is now 58 years old, which is the sort of the trend globally. Um, so we need to create that opportunity in agriculture. We need to create the jobs. We also need to see, um, like, the uh, involvement of women in agriculture were more than um, almost half of them in developing countries. Uh, women are in the agriculture workforce, but they have very unequal access to, to the resources that would be really needed to create the opportunity for them. However, it's not all doom and gloom. I mean, we are seeing also really interesting uh, trends uh, that are emerging, uh, which, uh, which, are, uh, which are kind of positive. Um, first is perhaps that we are seeing a lot of uh, interest uh, from investors on emphasizing what we call responsible investments, that is, which sort of looks at social, environmental, and economic returns. And so that's being factored into investment decisions and strategies. Uh, the sustainable investing um, market, which used to be sort of a niche um, kind of market, uh, is now, um, we, we see now that it's now almost one fourth of global assets are being uh, managed through these sustainable strategies. Um, and it is projected that because of climate and health related costs that this is, this will really be um, investment decisions will really take into, f uh, f uh, take into account uh, sort of the sustainable investing um, uh, strategies. 
And many companies are also realizing uh, uh, that future success and competitiveness will also depend on their ability to really meet society's goals. Um, and there is really interesting research now that most of uh, some countries which are uh, looking at this, like issues uh, which are working on with higher level of purpose, are sort of outperforming and are much more profitable. And this has really is interesting because that has led to also a huge um, uh, emphasis on business model inf uh, innovations, uh, which will sort of maximize what we call triple bottom lines, which are which are basically companies return on people, planet, and also pro profit. Um, and what's really other, another really uh, positive trend that consumers themselves are like factoring in um, environmental and social factors in their purchasing decisions. So we are seeing uh, the science. So you see a huge um, expansion of new healthier food products. You you are you see consumers asking for low sodium or increasing demand for low sodium or low sugar products. More demand for so sort of. Um, Alter alternative proteins, um, plant-based products. So you see the Impossible Burger now in Bur um, Impossible Burger now in Burger King, which in a few years back, who would have thought? But um, so these are really interesting trends that are coming up, and it this this market has really um, really improved and increased in the last few years. And of course, you are also seeing governments also putting a lot of emphasis on sustainability and nutrition. They are developing climate action plans, and they are committing to such goals. Um, well, agriculture is still not very much part of the um, mitigation strategies, but hopefully we will move in that direction soon. We are seeing also uh, company uh, countries putting together nutrition plans, so they are taking a more of a deliberate approach in sort of addressing some of these systems challenges. And lastly, um, what are the really interesting trends which I will focus a lot of my um, discussion on later is also on um, the new advancements on agriculture, biotech, on digital technology, on data, which is really uh, could be s transformative going forward for food systems. And you know, in 2018, the agri-food tech sector got a record-breaking 16.9 billion of funding, which is quite uh, substantial if you see compared to other decade, uh, previous decades. But um, these are all very encouraging signs, and they are um, um, they are positive, but they are not really transformative. Food systems are are still very complex. Um, it's increasingly interconnected. There's a diverse multitude of um, stakeholders in there, and all of these innovations that are happening are still happening at a uh, piecemeal fashion, in a siloed approach, and it's not really leading to the sort of um, a systemic change and are not reflecting the dynamism of food systems that we aspire for. And as the previous panelists were mentioning, we actually really require sort of a, you know, a, um, a fundamental change in the way the food is produced, including the agriculture practices of more than 500 million smallholder farmers who um, um, produce on less than two hectares of land and also a fundamental change in the pattern of consumption of around 7 billion people, um, individual consumers worldwide. So with that in mind, I think one of the key things that we are hearing a lot of is, the, is, is on the role of technology and innovations. And, and, and that can, um, we are seeing is can provide a huge opportunity going forward. And um, there has been, um, and this is also driven quite a lot by improvements, what we are seeing in sort of computing power and storage and bandwidth, and that has really transformed the digital world, as we speak, the digital technologies. And that combined with sort of the advancements we are seeing in sort of like um, the uh, sciences and others, it and the fourth industrial technologies really could have a significant sort of transformative power um, uh, going forward. So a few years back, um, we started, we initiated this, in a, this initiative called Innovation with a Purpose, um, really trying to see how can we leverage the power of emerging technologies to address the key challenge of the food system to create that sort of a leapfrogging uh, opportunity. So we work with um, our collaborators at the time, McKinsey, to really do a whole mapping and scanning to and to that, we identified around 12 technology innovations which we feel could be transformative um, they are everything from technologies that can change the shape of demand to um, promote market linkages or um, 
effective production systems. Um, um, and these, um, we also try to sort of illustrate the potential of these technology innovations by putting some impact numbers on how much take it positively impacts sort of uh, consumer nutrition or farmer profitability and others. Um, what we wanted to do is to demonstrate that how much, um, you know, um, opportunity there is if we can sort of find a way to leverage this technology innovation. I think that was also one of the things that was quite sort of um, highlighted by the last panel that there is a, this is, this, this is technology innovations could be such an interesting um, opportunity going forward. But it, because for example, if you look at something, uh, giving one example at, at food safety, I mean, you probably all know about this a example, but um, uh, a few years back, IBM and Walmart did a pilot and really trying to use blockchain technology to track food across this food supply chain. And they found that what used to take them seven days to trace food, they could do it in 2.2 seconds. I mean, I mean, that is so interesting because you could then, um, having that kind of technology could help s so, um, you know, the response time when you have food contamination, the value chain, and how much time you'll be possible to like do the recalls could be truly transformative and a uh, hugely, you know, decrease the sort of cost associated with these kind of um, food safety issues. And now, of course, um, that pilot has now been expanded because of the uh, great results they are showing. So. There is a huge opportunity, but I think one the one of the things that we also found from our research is that maybe 2018 was a big breakthrough year, as I mentioned, but the kind of investments that's going to food and ag-related startups is it's much less than any other sector we are seeing. Um, not any other, but most other sectors. So we compared that with healthcare. It's um, the kind of um, investments that went into it from 2010 to 2017. It was one-tenth of the uh, of the investments that went to healthcare, um, and and the reasons are are because of the systemic issues related to food and agriculture, right? It's it's fragmented rural markets. There's poor infrastructure, radical regulatory burdens, consumers willing to pay more. All of these issues are perhaps really uh, re the reason technology and f uh, has not been able to work in food and agriculture. We also found that a lot of these innovations. Uh, where in developed countries, which is probably not very surprising, given um, um, big given sort of the resources um, available here. Um, what was also interesting, and most of these investments were very much focused on sort of it, they were not very focused on consumer demand side. It was very much focused on one part of the value chain on sort of more the production side. Um, so. One of the things I wanted to mention also is also is that um, the potential of such emerging technologies is is could be huge, but it also raises and introduces new challenges. Um, they raise also concerns related to health and, uh, and safety, uh, on, on the environment, on privacy, on ethics. Um, so there could be um, unintended consequences that one needs to explore. Um, and and um, one of the key concerns, which I think uh, a panel panelist and uh, one of the panelists mentioned in the last panel, is also who has access to it, right? I mean, uh, you know, the uh, the benefits could not may not be if uh, if we don't do it in a more deliberative approach, um, the positive ben benefits may not be equally distributed. So it it might actually deepen the divide between the rich and the poor. Um, or the ones who have access to such technology innovations um, and the ones who don't. So, um, so w our, um, w our key um, message at, uh, at the forum is on um, we need to really, we if we want to really harness the positive impact of such technology innovations and also um, um, avoid the potential downfalls or at least um, um, explore the unintended consequences of such technology innovations, we really need to create what we call the right enabling environment or what we call the innovation ecosystems. And that requires that um, uh, uh, all the stakeholders in the ecosystem, whether it's governments or private sector across the value chain, farm organizations, research institutes, civil society organizations, really cr work together to create the right investments, the right policy incentives, the right governance frameworks, and also the right capacity for the farmers and others to adopt such uh, technology innovations. So the key to developing an innovation ecosystem from our perspective is that, uh, we, you know, is to determine the most, perhaps the most pressing um, development or commercialization challenge 
in a given market and to really see what are, how can it be resolved. And then really looking at how, um, tech, what technology innovators can bring. But of course, technology innovators alone cannot do this. It requires private sector, public sector, civil society, research institutions, and others to also combine their resources and capabilities to create that sort of a transformative approach. So what we think is that technology alone will not be able to solve, but you need uh, you need to have the continuing investment in sort of physical infrastructure, the roads, the ports, the broadband capacity. Um, you need the right enabling policy incentives in place, the regulations, the tax breaks, and others. Uh, you need to create the capacity, as someone was mentioning, the farmers need, you need to build the capacity of farmers to enable them to create, to adopt these technology innovations. They need the right uh, skills, the financing, and you need um, the consumers also to, you know, be, it should be affordable, they should be able to pay, they should be also be able to, like, take the benefits of such um, policy innovations. So, um, at the World Economic Forum, as I mentioned, we have been working on something called innovation with a purpose, and the goal of this um, uh, initiative has been really to not only leverage the role of uh, emerging technologies, um, but also to look at how can we, well, our sole focus has been a lot to strengthen innovation ecosystem, because we believe with our, with our convening and our multi-stakeholder networks, uh, this is where we can sort of lean in. So we, our role has been more to like, in, um, through this initiative, um, look at how do we increase investments on uh, developing scalable technology solutions, the right policy incentives, um, mitigate unintended consequences, and then also unlock institutional challenges. Um, it, the initiative um, is is a um, is like is a pr platform. Uh, it's a sort of a large scale project, and uh, we have we play a lot of a catalyst role. We support uh, projects uh, for scaling. Uh, we are supporting and catalyze cat have catalyzed projects in uh, India, in Kenya, and Southeast Asia, as well as a really interesting project on led by Stanford University on developing a financing vehicle for um, bl bringing tech solutions to underserved communities um, uh, in. Um, to beat he meet he health and nutrition needs. So, and we have also uh, come up with a few insights report and one of them uh, um, that we um, uh, published earlier this year was really looking at the uh, role of uh, three of those emerging technologies, blockchain, IoT, and food sensing technology and looking at how that can address one big problem in the food value chain, which is traceability. So how these technologies can address traceability in the food value chain, but really looking at, again, what is the innovation ecosystem that's going to be in place to create that kind of a, uh, a um, sort of a multi-stakeholder uh, multi approach going forward. I think in summary, I, I would like to emphasize, I mean, what, what was much more eloquently sp spoken about in the previous uh, panel was on so the re really, um, f well, the f the need for sort of the collective leadership. I mean, food supply ch supply chains now um, uh, cross national borders. It is multidisciplinary, multi-sectoral. They're diverse, uh, complex. Uh, it's complex. There's a whole multitude of actors who are involved in the food supply chain, and so what we really need is perhaps like those kind of yes, individual and collective leadership to to work across all of these. Uh, stakeholders and all of these organizations and also to really create sort of a more systemic approach and that's where the multi-stakeholder platforms is key because we need that those kind of platforms to create that kind of transformational um, uh, innovation otherwise all of the innovations that are being done in a lot of organizations and will never be able to perhaps meet the kind of scale and impact that would really be needed to m meet the needs of people and planet um, uh, by uh, going forward. So with that, I would like to um, thank you for giving me this opportunity and happy to take any calls, uh, any questions, and, um, and uh, um, thank you for the invitation. We've collected your questions from Aspora from within the room and online. You're welcome to continue to submit them and we'll do our best to accommodate them as time permits. Um, and so if you do have those questions on cards, feel free to hold them up um, and they will be collected and we'll get to those. 
All right, Ms. Bora, your first question is, what resources and support are available for professionals in agriculture to be innovative and take part in advancing technology? Many are just surviving with the time and money they have. Uh, resources available from where? Or um, what resources are available for people who are work are professionals? professionals. professionals. Um, well, I mean, I mean, universities such as uh, yours is actually providing a lot of resources for professionals who are helping support this. I mean, there is, um, um, you know, it's providing the skills, the capabilities that are needed. Um, there are organizations like civil society organizations and others who are helping support this, um, go, uh, providing professionals with also like, if, if I guess I'm trying to understand the question, if it's like maybe startups and others who are doing sort of really interesting work, there's a huge lot of opportunities av available through sort of financing, through a lot of um, catalytic financing now available. Um, through sort of linkages with private sector and others, with, pri with uh, civil society organization, with governments who are providing a lot of policy incentives. I guess, um, I, I guess my um, my uh, my thought would be that um, one should probably look at like what is the what is a big gap that a professional is facing in terms of uh, their uh, professional aspirations and the work they're doing in this field and then look at around on who can help support that. I, um, I, and I'm sure there is a lot of mentoring opportunities that can also be provided to help that. And I believe our next question will be coming from the audience. Test, test, oh, here we are. So we did have another one from the audience. Um, so the US saw a dramatic increase in ag technology in the last 70 years, yet it is the number one industrialized country for number of obese individuals, which is a form of malnutrition. How does the new hope for technology result in different outcomes? Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. I mean, uh, it, if you look at obesity uh, issue, I mean, it's also, um, I mean, it is a very, very new, uh, a complex issue, right? I mean, it's it has to do with access to nutritious food, which is dependent on a lot of things. It's not just the availability, it's the income, access uh, to uh, the income that, f uh, f you know, individuals have to access nutritious food. It also is linked to sort of awareness um, of, uh, of, um, of uh, uh, what is actually is healthy and nutritious food. Uh, and um, a lot of times, uh, those that's not available. Um, if you if you look around, I mean, um, the um, the food that you most of the obese uh, the f processed food is much more cheaper, right? Than healthy and nutritious food. Not and many people can go to farmers market and buy really in, uh, you know healthy and nutritious food. I think. Technology is going to be one of the solutions, but it, it requires a it, it's a it, it's a much larger issue than that. It requires a sort of a huge, um, probably um, uh, you know collaboration. The so governments need to really also really look at how they can address this by really maybe providing doing more regulations, more um, sort of um, uh, dietary guidelines, um, certifications. Um, uh, technology can also help to perhaps to provide sort of like information to consumers uh, of like you know there's new technologies on food sensing technologies and others where you can probably go to a supermarket and see what food is more nutritious than others so which will probably be providing much more awareness on what is a good and nutritious diet for people but then it also requires sort of business model innovations right um, a lot of people cannot access it because of the affordability issue, right? And so how can we make nutritious food um, affordable? And that is there technologies that can, or business model innovation that can reduce the cost of, uh, a cost of food, uh, so that a healthy food, so that uh, it's much more accessible for population. And really also, um, w how can we also help businesses in some ways to really innovate towards making products which are less in sugar, less in sodiums, uh, less processed, and um, what would be needed, what are the incentives that would be needed for businesses also to create products which will, in the foreign market, which will reduce obesity. I think it's a, it's a larger than just technology, but it's a more of a systems level approach that one has to take. 
Okay, so the next, um, in regards to the global food system, you said that the industry or system is not as interconnected as it should be. Are there other industries or global systems we should be looking at which are better connected? That's, that's a really good question. I mean, um, um, maybe because I work in food and all that, uh, because food and agriculture, everyone comes from the view that their system is much more, um, much more complex. Um, it does feel much more complex than, say, the healthcare and other system of approach. Um, I think f food is so multi-sectoral, multidisciplinary that it's it just feels much more fragmented, um, and and there is a huge fragmentation from the producers, the farmers who are making the food, and the consumers who are eating the food, and um, and I think I don't um, I mean. I don't, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't see that in many other sectors. So I think that is why I feel like this um, food and agriculture is perhaps much more complex and fragmented and siloed in their uh, way of looking at it. And I think as globalization, we are after mo our world is much more interconnected. What we eat here affects um, uh, affects the demand and the supply chain all the way to farmers in Africa and Asia and Latin America. Uh, so I think um, that kind of complexity and interconnectedness at the same time fragmentation makes, makes it much more of a complex issue to sometimes tackle. But it has to be tackled because as we see, it's, there is, this is the where food and agriculture is going to be crucial for the people and planet going forward. So we really need to really look at how do we tackle this chariot and how can we do this? Because right now, as I mentioned, I don't think food systems are fit for purpose uh, for people and planet. Perfect. And another one, you described several strategic innovations. Could you describe one or two that could most quickly be implemented in the US? Uh, I mean, I mean, some of them are very, very emerging technologies, right? The sensors and all are really could be transformative, but the cost of sensors are still very high. I think where we are seeing um, quite a, already a huge uptake is the digital technology, right? I mean, US is, uh, you know, um, you know, I mean, it could be everything. You can digital technologies and um, the platforms, the sh you know, that those are those are already that that's perhaps much more. Uh, further advanced um, than some of the other ones that are that were on a 12 or so, 14 or so, um, uh, you know, 12 or so emerging technologies I highlighted. One that was not there is AI, which would be, this was a few years back, we already feel dated, but I think artificial intelligence is going to be really big going forward. Um, when we did this two, three years back, uh, this scanning, we thought alternative protein was going to be a big market, and then last few years it just exploded, right? So you, it almost feels like as we speak, everything is going to be dated. So yeah, I think the digital is definitely one of the things that I think data platforms will be really, really big. I think data data is going to be really big. It's also going to be the m very uh, biggest challenge of our lifetime, maybe, because the c we are seeing also a huge consolidation of data among a few. And that's not just for you know, Facebooks and others. We are seeing that in the ag and f ag, ag systems also. A lot of data is being consolidated for a few players in the market. So what does that implication have on who monetizes it? How is platform? Do farmers have access to their own information? I think that is going to be like one of the big challenges that we will see in the, in the, in the future. So here's another one. Um, the order of the goals is often overlooked. Why do you think there has been little to no investment from ES6? Investment in goal number two, despite the UN ESOC stating two million or two trillion, sorry, dollars is needed in investment in the sector. Um, for example, the healthcare sector is 12% of GDP and receives 12% worldwide investment. The ag sector, by comparison, is 10% GDP and two billion people and 35% total investment. Yeah, I mean that's that's a really good question, and um, it's it's a, it's also really um, sad that it's actually investments are going down, both public and private investments. I mean, if you look at the you know public investments the governments are putting in um, on agriculture, it is going down quite a bit. You see the uh, the kind of in, um, uh, investments on public goods that governments are putting in on research 
and development that is really would be needed to meet the current challenges and the future that's going down. And some say that the private sector, I mean, I don't really have the number, but apparently private investments are also going down, which is also, a uh, it, is, um, it is quite shocking, and I don't know if I have the answer why it's going down. Maybe it's a huge, you know, agriculture is difficult. I mean, we speak to business leaders quite a bit, and they're, um, it's very difficult in a lot of geographies to make uh, make money out of agriculture to be honest like if you if I mean I work in India and if you talk to global comp uh, companies who are working in India it's one of the most regulated markets it's very difficult um, because of um, the systems in place to make money out of this um, to in to invest in, in research and um, development and others and I and and I I, I, I think it's um, um, it also maybe it, uh, we are uh, and the new work that we are doing at the World Economic Forum is also looking at the role of incentives. I think some of the incentives that have been put forward in the ag and food sector was was put in place maybe decades back when the goal was like food security and self sufficiency. We have now moved to a new frontier, which is maybe looking at, at you know environment, nutrition, and health. And um, the incentives that are in place right now is uh, whether it's uh, uh, the government policy subsidies, uh, a lot of subsidies are in pl or the financial incentives and all. Financial, non-financial incentives are not in place to really create a mechanism to unlock financing, to unlock the constraints that are happening um, in, in, a, in the sector. So I think that could be one of the things and one of the work that we are doing and it's actually a big report that we are publishing in a uh, in um, in uh, in the next next month is all all looking at the role of incentives in food systems because we feel it's a question of like um, uh, realigning some of these incentives, and it's sad to say that it's I mean I'm like in the, after the food crisis led to a huge focus on ag and food and we actually saw a lot of momentum a lot of investments and then it's just become this oh, business as usual approach, which is like, we don't need to wait for another food crisis, right? To get sort of our, 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 our you know, us, our um, systems in place. So um, I, I think it's, uh, that's also some, a little bit of lethargy has probably set in, um, uh, in the sector. I, be <coughs> I believe that there is a balance between providing resources for our communities to live and thrive and being responsible conservationists and stewards of our environment. What are some of the conversations being had around balancing conservation and agriculture in some of the areas you're working? Uh, conservation and agriculture. I think one. Well, um, uh, um, yeah, it's um, it's also really uh, one of the most complex uh, issues that our team has been working on. Is is uh, is it's, it's which was mentioned a little bit uh, recently was on a on protein on the future of protein. Um, it's it's a very sensitive and complex issue and um, and what we feel is um, and it's leading to a lot of you know you see the Amazon and all it's being uh, sort of destroyed because the, because of the demand for sort of like um, feedstock which uh, which is going to go into like you know the meat or other industry or which will which is big based on the demand that consumers are making for meat and other products and it's not. It's what we are seeing. It's this is not a binary con conversation about what's right and what's wrong, and you have to I, either give up meat or not give up meat, or you know. There's a lot of. Um, there was a big report came out. Uh, I don't know. Many of you probably heard about it this earlier in this year on Eat Lancet Commission, and it's, you know, it's right. Globally, we need to eat less red meat, but in some regions, we need eat to eat more protein. A lot of developing countries, a lot of people are not getting enough protein, and let's not also forget a lot of these. Uh, farmers, uh, very poor farmers, their livelihoods depends on livestock industry. Um, a lot of countries' um, exports depend on the livestock industry. So it's a really much more nuanced conversation. And this is where we are, we have been working a lot on this issue also, really to rec see like, okay, um, you know, what is a sustainable future of protein could look like um, to meet the 21st century um, uh, discourse and it's uh, it's 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 a little bit related to conservation, environmental sustainability, health and nutrition aspects of it. But I think we have to look look at it at a more a more broader aspect. I mean, one is really looking at sort of our consumption and consumer patterns, um, whether it's towards more alternative forms of protein, then also like how we produce our sustainable production methods, and then also the lastly also really looking at. Um, 
you know, um, you know, alternate proteins and others, which are the new technologies that are coming up and how we address that. So yeah, so I think, um, yeah, these are, this is I think one of the really interesting things because it gets people really emotional about this topic, but it's, it's, it's um, and we, we, you know, but it is much more nuanced than saying like, this is it and this is not. And all of us have a personal responsibility of how we eat and what we eat. Um, uh, and, um, and, uh, and 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 but then again, um, s making it into um, y you're right, you're wrong. It's leading to it probably uh, not advancing this conversation for much either. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Bora.